Welcome to Wagons of Steel. It's a party and everyone's invited. This week I'm going to be talking about the beginnings of Wagons of Steel and the early years of drag racing. Wagons of Steel started in 1988 or 89 when I was living in Oakland. I was an art student. I was uh, living with a whole bunch of guys in uh, an old building, the Atlas Imperial Marine Diesel Research something. It used to be the headquarters for the Atlas Imperial Marine Diesel Engine Company. And uh, it was built in 1903. It was on the corner of Glasscock and Peterson. It was a neat building and uh, for a lot of different reasons. It attracted a whole bunch of cool art student types. and. Um, one day we're all sitting, it was right on the corner on the second floor so you could look down and see down Glasscock or Peterson and, and uh, uh, my friend Owen came rolling up in his, his some, I, was, I think it was a 66 or 67 a pet Impala, a Caprice, Biscayne, some full size Chevy, all rusty and four door and he had brought it from Ohio or it was from Ohio and it had Ohio tags on it still and um, we looked out the window and I said ah, isn't that funny you know back in the day all the, these pioneers used to come out looking for gold and their wagons made out of wood and now now everyone's coming out in their wagons of steel and it wasn't even a station wagon but it was we were talking about wagons crossing the country to find their fortune in California and so the wagons of steel term is just Sometimes it's just a turn of phrase. It'll just stick and that was one of those turns of phrase and so it, it, We started calling all kinds of stuff right wagons of steel and um, I uh, Appropriated the name and used it for I put it on t-shirts as a t-shirt printer then like I am now and um, What else did I do with it? Oh, we we made uh, I think I I, I can't remember what else I did with the name at that time. It was just it was just one of many names of stuff that I had in my repertoire. I was also I was King Cobra Productions, so Wagons of Steel was kind of like a like a subsidiary or whatever. So uh, 1980, end of 1989, 1990, I moved back up here to the Northwest from California, and um, when I got up here. I scored a 1965 station wagon and it was a, um, a Plymouth Valiant and uh, of course I wrote Wagons of Steel on the side of that and uh, that was when it really Wagons of Steel got rolling and uh, literally and I used that car for everything I bought it for $20 um, it was slant six of course it had a what's wrong with it, it had um, God, what was that? It'll come to me. And, uh, so I drove that car around and, uh, kind of built up the reputation for Wagons of Steel and the name kept coming up over and over again. So I made a Wagons of Steel magazine. Here's the first Wagons of Steel magazine. I still have it. Got the centerfold in it. It's got all kinds of recipes. Typical wagon to steal. It, um, see one of these? It's it's going to be worth a million dollars someday. I swear. So I uh, I made wagons to steal magazine. Then I made my first wagons to steal calendar. I'm still making the wagons to steal calendar. I actually still make a magazine once in a while. And um, uh, we're off and running. So then sometime 1993, I uh, went to a, uh, a Mopar show, you know, Mopar's all Chrysler products, Chrysler, Plymouth, Dodge, with my buddy, Anders Newcomer. And we, we heard about the show, it was at Seattle International Raceway. And keep in mind at this point, I barely knew what racing was and I'd never been to a drag race. But we wanted to go see the Mopar show. Here's a photo from that. There's a, it's a 72 Plymouth Fury. And uh, here's somebody in a, char, a 
charger, which I thought was pretty cool at the time. And I saw this drag racing, and oh my god, I I I was hooked immediately. It just just like the wagon to steel name, I saw in drag racing. God, that's what I've got to do with my life. I've got to race. I love this. It was like a car show, but the cars actually did something, and I I loved every minute of it. So oh, here's a picture with. This is show and tell. It's like being at your grandmother's house. Here's uh, three of my vehicles around that time. The uh, the green station wagon is obviously early running Mighty Josephine back when she was my daily driver. The car in the background is Eduardo, the Valiant. And then the pickup truck was my work truck, Pookie the pickup, the Toyota. Here's a... Here's another picture of the Mighty Josephine. I picked her up around, obviously I went to the Mopar show with her to looking for bits and pieces, so that was 93. So I think I got Josephine in 92. And I paid the big bucks for her. I think I paid 500 bucks for that car. You know, after I went, you know, I can't remember if this is before or after I went, probably after I went racing for the first time, you can see there's a camera mount in there. So this car's probably been to the racetrack by this time. The inside's all gutted out, and that's something you just do with a race car anyways, uh, especially, I mean, now I race stock eliminator where you have to have a full interior, so you got to play all kinds of tricks, and you can't just gut the interior, but this car, I gutted the interior because most of it was rotten, as tends to be in a $500 car, interior's usually not that good. Here is another step I took in the evolution of the Mighty Josephine. We took it to Stan's headers and had him put dual exhaust on it. And they did a really nice job. You know, it's, it's, it's expensive to get a good exhaust system, but I think it's worth the money. It makes it sound better. It gives you better performance. And if, it, if you do get a good one done, then you can pull it off that car and put it on other cars and et cetera, et cetera. So after I had the dual exhaust on it and then uh, Dr. Big Block helped me have, put a 440 in it. Oh yeah, put a good motor in it too. And um, so then uh, I decided I, I had to go to the drag strip. And I happened to have found a couple of pretty cool pictures of the first time I ever went racing. You can see that was, I mean, even if you've been racing for many years as I have by this point, seeing like that, it's just psychedelic. I mean, it, you don't want to, you know, I, I'm a firm believer in drag racing totally straight, but it's, it, it felt like a drug experience. Here's the first pass. Here's another good shot from the, the starting line. It, it seems like there were more people at the drag strip back then. It was a, a test and tune night. There's another shot. And then I had to bring Dr. Big Block, Mike Breno, my crew chief. He, uh, uh, he'd never been racing before. I just couldn't believe it. I mean, this is a guy who can put this stuff together in his sleep and he'd never been to the drag strip. So here is the morning of our first drag race at Pacific Raceway. After my opening event, this is like when we went out together. You can see Josephine on one side and Mike's facing his car, which is a black Newport. And we're off. I was, I was racing all the time after that. I, every chance I got, any car that I needed to take, I would take. Uh, anything that can run is a race car, really. I mean, it's, it's up to you. Uh, I. These days, I, I don't like to race my tow rig, and I don't like to race my daily driver, and I won't race my wife's car, or my mom's car. I pretty much bring a race car in a trailer, and you know, it's cool. Back then, I'd race anything. Here I am one fine, sunny Sunday morning. It took, I think it took a year before we even won a round. We used to go together and like, well, we'll race each other, at least one of us will win. Here's another shot in the early days. You can see I had wagons of steel written in shoe polish on the side of the car. Mm -hmm. 
Here's another drag racing shot. Back when they had cigarette advertising all over the drag strip. Winston drag racing. Here we are on the ferry dock. The whole crew going out. That was uh, Dr. Big Block had his gold coronet at that point. Back behind him, you can see Mark Buholm's black coronet. At this point, we were doing most of our work at a place called The Ranch. That was, uh, it was down the street from me. Every, everything's close on Vashon Island. It's a little island. Another weekend bracket racing shot. By that time, I have the flame job on the side of it. Here's another car I raced for a while. This is my friend Renee. She learned how to drag race in this car. This is another, I don't think, I think I paid $200 for this Valiant. This one's a 64, not a 65. And you can see it's been T boned pretty hard on one side, but it drove like a, it drove straight as a string. And it was a push button automatic. It was, it was fun to race. I actually won quite a few races with that car. It was a, um, look at that grill. That's, it's a, fits in a Barracuda too, so that grill is probably worth a lot of money to somebody. I don't even know where that car is now. It was slow. It, it's funny, a Slant 6 cars, they feel like, they feel like, a, um, like a fast golf cart, like the the torque curve on a slant six. It's just, you can, when you go out the driveway, you point it where you're going, you put the gas pedal all the way to the floor. You're never going to go too fast, but you'll get to however fast you're going to go pretty quickly. And so everybody would ride around with me in that car would say, oh, I bet this car's going to run 15s or 14s or you know, something like that. But it actually ran 1860s, which is, you know, Good enough to get the job done. You just put whatever you think the car is going to run, dial it in, and run your number, cut a light. And it was the push button, which was really fun to, you know. I'd, most of the time, with a car that slow, it's not worth risking shifting, so you just put it in drive. But it's fun to, you know, click the buttons, first, second, drive. Now, at this point... I got a sponsor, my friend Steve Payne at Vashon Auto Parts, and he told me, I'm sick of looking at all that spray paint on that wagon, talking about Josephine. Why, why don't we do some body work on it and paint it? And this is the result. That's a lot of slime green, I'm here to tell you. And you've heard me say this before. You'll regret painting a car slime green if you do it. I promise you that. Here's what it looked like eventually when it was all dressed for battle. I can't remember what place I got. I was I was deadly serious about racing, bracket racing at that time. That's at Bremerton Raceway. Here's a shot of it from the front. I think that those six pack hood scoops look really good. I um I ended up putting that hood on after I smashed a deer one night. Actually have a, it's hard to tell from this photo maybe. That's what's so beautiful about these cars. That's all deer goo all over the inside of there. But you can see the, like there's, there's no damage at all. You could kind of tell if you look at it, just cause I'm telling you, the grill is, the, the bumper is just smashed back. I mean, I hit a big deer going way too fast. I was probably going 70 or 80 miles an hour, showing off for somebody late at night and just smash this deer. It was, it was a mess, but it obviously didn't interfere with the operation of the car at all. I mean, look how far back that radiator is from the bumper. There's no hope of ever touching that with, from, with a, you know, collision. You'd, You'd have way worse things to worry about than your radiator if you actually fucked your radiator up from hitting it, something with this car. Here's the um, my uh, the shop where I was printing T-shirts was at a uh, an old 
greenhouse complex. It used to be the biggest greenhouse complex in the world, I think, at one point. They they made, did a lot of roses, and at one point they grew a lot of orchids, all here on Vashon. And they had to heat the place with oil, and, you know, the oil crisis hit, and they started growing their orchids in Colombia. And so it got kind of shut down, halfway abandoned, and then I got a cheap spot in there to print t-shirts. And so I would work on my car there, and you can see here I was probably doing... This, which anybody who plays with eight and three quarter rear ends in heavy cars will tell you is pretty common practice. You, I would just routinely just blow the teeth off the ring gear with that car at the drag strip. That was before I even ran slicks that often. I'll tell you what, I started to feel guilty about all the eight and three quarter rear ends I was blowing up. It was, and I was driving the car to the track at the time, so I'd have to bring an extra rear end in a bucket so when I blew it up, I could put something back in the car so I could get home or continue racing. So I, I didn't get tired of it, but I, I kind of could tell writing was on the wall, working on racing cars that big, that, that in Chrysler, it's called a C body. That's the full size Brady Bunch size wagon, you know, the rear seat, nine passenger, et cetera, et cetera. So I started playing with this car, which my friend Tom brought me. He thought it was a Fury, but it's a Belvedere, which is a B body. The, it's the, the midsize, which is my, my favorite. This is a 66. And this would become the Helvedere. And it was named the Helvedere by some track worker when it was at this stage, because it had the, the little mini flame job that I put on the front because uh, the paint had all fallen off the front of the car. I think it's pretty high mileage car. I ended up painting that car like this. You can see the red, white, and blue paint job. And by this point, this is the shop we're in right now. I didn't have the lift yet, but I painted that car all here. Here's a shot of it outside. Here's an early shot of it going down the track. I had like the small slicks on the back of that car. It was pretty fast. Eventually that car, I got it to go 1060s at 125 miles an hour, which is fast. Here's the hood. I love doing hoods. So that's kind of how, pretty much how the beginning of Wagons of Steel went down. Uh, I've, um, I'll tell you what, it was a pain going through all those photographs, but I did it for you. And uh, next time I'll have to dig around in the computer because around this time everything went digital. Uh, we'll just have to see how that works out in the future for future generations. Uh, there's going to be no more boxes of photos to dig through. Hopefully we don't lose a whole bunch of stuff, something to think about. Well, that's all for today. I will see you next week with more cool stuff. I've got some good ideas. Talk to you later.